about helps and hindrances to prayer. There are many benefits to derive from prayer. It's amazing how people talk so much about prayer and do very little praying. I mean, we pray. People pray in school. When school opens, they pray. Um, when they have their meals, they pray grace after meals and so on. But we want to have prayer that is effective, amen? amen? And I want to encourage you about that because there are many benefits of prayer. There's much to gain in learning to pray effectively. First of all, prayer averts temptation. Jesus says in Matthew 26, 41, he says, Watch and pray, go ahead, that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I'm sure there are many times that we could think in our own lives, where in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits, we wanted to do what is right, but then in our flesh, we couldn't find the will and the power to do it. We wanted to avert what is wrong, but in our flesh, we couldn't find the will and the power to do it. Jesus says, we have to pray so that we don't enter into that temptation. And the temptation is not only the temptation based on the drawing away of our own lust, but also the trials of life that cause us to lose faith and to lose hope. So prayer averts temptation. Jesus teaching his disciples to pray in Matthew 6, 13. He taught them to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So you can avoid yourself a lot of stress and a lot of struggle by praying in advance of the potential stress and struggle. You don't have to wait until you are in a situation to pray. You don't have to wait until you reach a challenge to pray. Because Jesus is teaching us that prayer can avert the temptation. Prayer can prevent the trial. So when we understand the importance of something, it should give us, we should be stimulated to use it. When you don't know the use of something, you, you minimize it. I remember once we gave a birthday gift here, and it was a pen, a ballpoint pen, that had a stylus, and it also had a, a, a torchlight. And many people didn't know what this was for. And they just kept it. And therefore, it was underutilized. And if you go home now and you find it, you might find that the ink is dry and you can't even use the pen. And maybe the battery is corroded and you can't even use the, 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 the torchlight. We gave another gift that was, that was uh, um, something to hold your, your phone so that your phone could be charged and you could just hang it up on the wall and rest it. And again, some people didn't know what this little flip-flop thing is for. So I'm not just going to tell you, like, look, we have prayer meeting this evening. And yes, I am going to tell you, let's come together and gather as, as open Bible people at San Fernando and pray. I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to also tell you that on... on the Diwali holiday, I hope it's the Diwali holiday, but the 28th of October, I know that the captain declared the 27th as the Diwali holiday, I didn't hear anything about the Monday, but I'm assuming that the tradition of any time a holiday falls on a Sunday that the Monday is a public holiday. I didn't see that notice um, officially sent out. It was? Or oh, I saw a notice from the Prime Minister's office that said the Diwali is the 27th of October. I didn't see saying that Monday is a holiday. But let's assume that Monday is a holiday. We want to spend a day of prayer and fasting. Come together from 9 to 3 at least. And let's put aside the roti for that day. Put aside the, 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 the river lime. Put aside the beach lime. And let's come together and pray. Prayer is very important. You need to take time to pray to avert temptations. You do not know what is lurking ahead. You do not know what plots the enemy have for you in your life. I don't want to leave home without praying because I don't know if I hit that highway or I hit that road, what is to be setting me. If, if I come to the office here, what is be setting me? I remember very early in my ministry here, I was, and Sister Bino will remember, um, it, I think it was in the December of 2011, I was coming to a normal Tuesday morning service and I was in traffic Minding my own business in traffic at pause at a standstill right there on high street at two way traffic, no major road, no minor road, nobody transported. And just like that, a pickup hit me at the side, bam, a pickup coming this way hit me, so bam, 
right at the side of the driver's door. I think I had to call you and you had to take the service or something. You was retired already? So what are you doing here? Anyway. <laughs> yes, yes, but you probably was doing a... Anyway, whatever it was. But, but there was no way that I could have anticipated that accident. You know, you think you get an accident on the highway or you break a major road or something. And I really saw this car coming through and it's swinging, 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 swinging and coming at a speed. But I never imagined, and in any case, even if I did imagine, there was nothing I could do because I'm in a standstill in traffic and you get in an accident. Could you imagine that? So you don't know what is lurking. Who knows, the devil probably wanted to stop me from being the pastor of this church. And probably he's still trying. So we have to pray to avert temptation. To avoid the trouble. And sometimes we forget and we become so presumptuous that we feel we can handle business because everything going smooth. So we need to pray lest we enter into temptation. And we need to pray, Lord, don't lead us in that place where the devil, where we have to be delivered from evil. Prayer is also an alternative to fainting. In Luke 18, 1, Jesus says, Men ought always, men ought to do what? Always pray. Not sometimes, not when it's convenient. But you need to pray always and not to faint. And this parable, this passage of scripture, Luke 18, he gives the story of, of the parable of a persistent woman and an unrighteous judge. And he talks about how she beseeches this unrighteous judge. And because of her persistence behind this judge, this unrighteous judge gave her justice. She did not faint. She did not give up. What does fainting mean? Fainting doesn't just mean to collapse and and, and lose your consciousness. But fainting indicates a type of behavior in the time of of, of misfortune uh, where you so desperate where you are are not caring because your hope is gone. That's why some people commit suicide because their hope is gone. That's why some people do reckless things. Beat up on their husband, beat up on their wife, curse and get on because they don't care about the consequences because there is no hope, there is no need, there is no need to be careful. Uh, They they have no, no hope. Their hope is gone. So they act in desperate way of measures. They behave recklessly because they are in despair. They feel there is little chance for hope or cure. So they're ready to run any risk. That's a kind of fainting too. Fainting is not just giving up and doing nothing. But when people act like that, it is also a, a sense of desperation that motivates them. And desperation is a sense of hopelessness. Where your hope is gone. And your care is gone. Why bother? There is nothing could be better. Nothing could be better. So Jesus is the one who says, we need to pray always so that we don't faint. So prayer doesn't only avert temptations and causes you to be delivered from the evil one, but it also is an antidote to despair. To running that, that state of desperation where you just lose hope and you're ready to run any risk, you don't care what happened. But prayer is not only avert negative things, it also stimulates positive things because it fulfills joy when it is answered. In John 16, 24, Jesus says, Hitherto, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask so that you could receive, so that your joy will be full. Have you had any reason to celebrate lately? That is why very often in our empowerment service, I like to ask for testimonies. Because the reason for asking for testimonies is to stimulate faith. So that people will know that we serve a prayer answering God. A God who delivers. And not only delivers us from, but who delivers things to us. Things that we need. He's a God who delivers. I'm not talking politics. You know, some parties deliver and some don't. But our God delivers. So Jesus says, if you don't pray, you have nothing to rejoice about. Would you like to have something to rejoice about? Then ask and you shall receive that your joy will be full. The kingdom of God is not being dungusory and unhappy and saying you can't do this and you can't do that. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And when you have your prayers answered, you have joy, fullness of joy. 
So prayer pr- fulfills joy when it's answered. Prayer also causes healing. There is a lot, lot of sickness. We prayed for sickness on Friday. But not only physical sickness, there's mental sickness, psychological sickness. There is a lot of ill health in our society and even in our church. In James chapter 5, verse 14 to 15, the Apostle Paul says, If is any sick among you, is any sick here among us, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And verse 15 says, And the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. Now, oil in scripture stands for a number of things. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol of the anointing. It was used by the prophets when they were anointing people to be kings, when they were anointing people to be priests, when they were anointing people to be prophets. So it's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. But when Jesus talked about the guy who was on the road to... um, Where he was going? He has so much people going all over the place. But this guy was ambushed. Jericho. He was going on a road. And he was ambushed. Right? And, sorry? Everybody calling all the names in the Bible. And then, a good Samaritan came. And what the Samaritan did to his wounds... He poured in oil and he poured in wine. Right? So there was alcohol and there was oil. That was the application of medicine. That was used for medicinal purposes. Alcohol was like an antiseptic and the oil was like a soothing balm. So when we talk about praying for the sick, we're not talking about abandoning medical science as a matter of fact when hezekiah was sick unto death the lord sent the prophet and he says put your house in order you're going to die hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed and while he was praying before the prophet even leave the courtyard god sent the prophet back and said to hezekiah i heard your prayer I'm going to give you 15 more years of life. So God answered his prayer. But most people stop reading the text there because they're excited to get healed. Later on, the prophet gives him instructions. He doesn't just pray for him. For whatever the reason, he asks him to take some figs and to put it under his knees and so on. What is that? That is the application of medicine. But it's not the medicine that heals. It is God who heals. Are you understanding me? So even though you pray and you apply the oil, even though you pray and you go to the doctor, it is the prayer of faith that will heal the sick. It's only one third of the people who understand what I'm saying. The rest of you still working it out. Do you understand what I'm saying? So don't go for medicine alone. Don't just go for medicine alone. Take prayer first. Take prayer first. And let God decide how he will choose to heal. He could heal instantaneously, miraculously. He could heal gradually, naturally. Or he can heal through the use of the oil. I don't want you to feel you have any power in olive oil, you know. The power is in the Holy Ghost. And it's a prayer of faith that ignites the power of the Holy Ghost. So I'm not saying to you that if you, if you go to the doctor or you take surgery... That you, are, you don't have any faith. How many of you believe God to feed you every day? So then why do you go to the grocery? Why do you work? Are you understanding? Does that mean that you have no faith? When God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, when there was no, no, no ground for them to, to, to plant because they were walking through the desert, and in any case, they're walking through. So even if they had ground to plant, by the next harvest, they wouldn't be there to reap it. So they were in impossible situations. God rained down manna from heaven. God provided water from a rock. But the day they crossed Jericho into fertile soil, all those miracles done. And they had to have now the faith to go and fight for their mountain. Because the land was inhabited 
by, by foreigners. They had to go and plant. But God prospered their planting. God prospered their efforts. So I don't want you to feel that when you're doing something or when you, you, you're taking advantage of the opportunities that God has provided for a certain thing that is not an act of faith. Otherwise, stay home and be hungry and ask God to drop groceries at your front door when you have a salary and you have a job and there's Massey right down the road and you have money in the bank. It makes no sense. God has already provided. You must always recognize that God is your source. You, your source is not your employer. Your source is not your gifts, not your abilities. It is God that gives you the power to earn wealth. So in everything, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're bright or you're stupid, you need to pray. So if any sick among you, let him call the elders. And you must call. Don't stay and complain. All right, I'll leave you that. <laughs> You must call the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Anoint him with oil. Don't tell him, throw away all your medicine. Throw away a stick. Get off your wheelchair. No. But I want you to understand that in spite of all of that, is a prayer of faith that heals. It's a prayer of faith that heals. That's where the healing is. The healing is in the power of God. And when you pray, you open up the heavens and you ignite the power of God. Is it making sense or am I confusing you? I mean, you have plenty of senses, get dollars. So the benefits of prayer are applicable to all of us. And therefore, we should be keen to want to discover what hindrances to prayer we should avoid and what helps to prayer we should adopt. This is not the time, therefore, to go into the ladies or gents or to go and take, drink some water or to talk to a friend on the phone or to see what messages you get on WhatsApp. If you're not using your phone to read your Bible, you need to take it off. Because then it's a distraction. The only thing you should be reading now is your Bible. And the only person you should be listening to now is me. Otherwise, you, can, you should not be here. You're wasting your time. And you're wasting my time too. So one of the things we're seeing this morning is that we want God to hear from us. And I'm going to take you to some snippets in James chapter 4 verse 1 to 10. When you go home, you should read it. But what are the things that help prayer? One of the things that help prayer is prayer. In James chapter uh, 4 verse 1 to 10, it says, From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust, that you war in your members, you lust and you have not, you kill and you desire to have, and you cannot obtain, you fight and you war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. You adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture said in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lost it to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he said, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn. Weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. So the first point in that in terms of helps to pray is that we must pray. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, You lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have and you cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. 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 not. We desire. We lust. We fight. And yet we can't obtain. How long are you going to keep fighting and beating up yourself? We ask not. So prayerlessness and spiritual indifference is the biggest hindrance to prayer. The less you pray is the less you are able to pray. The better you pray is the better you will get at it. And some have tried everything in the natural but to no avail. 
Remember, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are only mighty through God. And sometimes we are losing our battles because we are fighting with our own carnal physical weapons. In Psalm 3, 4, the psalmist says, I cried. Who cried? I cried. Not pastor, pray for me. I cried unto the Lord with my own voice. You know, some people that say, stand to your feet. And I always wonder, whose feet can I stand on besides mine? You know, I can cry for you, but I can't stand for you. You understand, have on your own feet. But that's another thing. But he says, I cried with my own voice. I uttered, I opened my mouth and I cried with my own voice. And get what? The Lord heard me. The Lord heard me. Me, a sinner. Me, a backslider. Me, a wandering soul. Because I cried unto him and he heard me way out of his holy heavens. So, many of us are busy eliciting prayers of others and not praying ourselves. How can God hear you if you do not cry? How can God answer you if you never ask a question? You receive not because you ask not. Ask that you may receive, that your joy may be full. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God and God will draw nigh to you. You need to take that step. You need to take that initiative. God is waiting for you to come. Jesus says, come unto me, all you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But you must come. So if we want help in prayer, then pray. You're not going to get help in prayer by reading about prayer, by asking people to pray and talking about prayer. You're going to get strong when you build muscles through exercise. So if you want prayer to work, then work it. Are you with me? So there's a call to prayer. There's a call to prayer. Then the second thing that is a help to prayer is repentance and being righteous. Verse 8, second major hindrance to prayer is sin. And sin occurs in two ways. First of all, sin occurs in disbelief. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Because those who come to God must first of all believe that God exists, but they must also believe that God rewards those who diligently seek Him. If I don't believe that God will reward my diligent seeking of Him, then I wouldn't bother to seek Him. Are you understanding? So I have to believe that if I diligently seek God, He will reward me. So disbelief is a sin that hinders your prayer life. In John 16, 9, the Bible says that... that, that, that um, the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because you do not believe in me. So not believing in Jesus is a sin. As a matter of fact, that's the only sin that will send you to hell. Because all other sins can be forgiven if you repent. But if you don't believe in him, you'll never repent. So the reason why you go to hell is not because you're killing, you commit adultery, and you're fornicating. It's because you don't believe in him. Because as many as believe in him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that will believe on his name. As many as receive him, even to them that believe on his name. So, disbelief is sin, and it hinders our prayer life. Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 40, 24. Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. Jesus is saying, Have faith faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. Have faith in God, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. That these things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Therefore I say unto you, that what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe. No believe after you receive it, believe it when you pray. And you shall receive them. And you shall have them. So have faith in God. Do not doubt in your heart. Believe. When you pray, believe. James chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. But let him ask in faith. That's what he's saying. Not wavering. For he that wavereth is like eve of the sea. Driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive 
anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So that's why in James chapter 4 verse 8, he says, purify your hearts from double-mindedness. Purify your hearts from a fascinating faith where you don't unequivocally believe in God. Disbelief is sin. And disbelief leads to disobedience. Adam and Eve in the garden. They never came to him and said, did God really say? Did God really say? They begin to doubt word, God's word. Begin to question God's word. God don't want you to be like him. God has an agenda. He don't want you to be like him. God don't want you to know the difference between good and evil. God don't want you to be like him. How God don't want you to be like him when he created you in his image and likeness. That's a lie. He wants you to be like him. He created you to function like him and to reflect his image and likeness. But the devil comes and says, the reason why God said don't eat that thing is because he don't want you to be like him. You begin to doubt God's word. You begin to doubt the integrity of God's word. And of course, that, that doubt was further complicated by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It opened the door. And, I, and the end result was disobedience. When your mother tell you late in the night, don't eat no green mango, your, be, your belly will hurt. And you still went and eat it. It's because you didn't believe if you eat it, your belly would hurt. Because if you had believed, you will obey. And then the fact that you eat it and it didn't hurt you, do it again. Yes or no? So, disobedience is a result of disbelief. Why do you think people just drive their car and still use their cell phone and text? It's because they believe they could do it and get away. They believe it's safe for them to do it. Let somebody else who's driving them do it. They will say, put on your phone. But if they're doing it, they feel it's safe. So, disbelief leads to disobedience. Because of their sin, they hid from the presence of God when previously they walked and they talked with God. So sin hinders our rapport with God. In Psalm 66 verse 18, the psalmist says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord is not going to hear me. So once you have a sin and you have a lust in your heart, it hinders your prayer life. Psalm 1, 28 to 29, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but I shall, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, they reject the word of God, and they didn't choose the fear of the Lord. So you see how disobedience hinders your prayer life. In Proverbs 28, 9, it says quite clearly that he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. So if you're not, if you turn off from God, why should God be tuned into you? The very prayer is an abomination. 1 John 1.19 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you're in that state of disobedience, your first prayer must be a prayer of repentance. So you need to repent. Repent and be righteous. Repent and be righteous. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. So let us be people of prayer and let us be people who will repent and be righteous. And I want to say something again that I told you before. When we talk about confess your sin, it's not just admitting that you have sinned. It's agreeing with God that you're wrong. You could say that you did something, but you could feel justified in what you've done. That is not repentance. That is not confession. It's when you admit that, yes, I was wrong to do so and so. I was wrong to do that. God, you are right. I am wrong. It's then you begin to confess, and then God forgives you. Just saying, I did it, I did it, I did it, and you don't care, and you do it again. That's, that's nothing. Don't feel that you're, you're forgiven at all. Do you understand that? So repent and be righteous if you want your prayer to be effective. Now, the third thing is you must abide in Christ. And in his word. First John 2, 15 to 17 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passes away and it's lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's what First John 15, 2, 15 to 17 says. So you cannot be holding on to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You need to extricate yourself from that. Romans 12, 1 to 2, the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world. Don't let this world squeeze you into its mold with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Rather, be transformed by renewing your mind, renewing the very bend of your thinking, so that you can prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In John 15, 7, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can ask for what you want and it shall be done. Because the word of God abides in you. The will of God is expressed in his word. And if you pray according to his word, then you will be praying according to his will. And therefore, it must happen because this is what he wants. So you have to let the word of God abide in you. So don't just pray, pray, pray. That's inspiration. You need to read the word to get revelation. And the inspiration and the revelation comes together so that the prayer is potent. It's in accordance with the word. In 1 John 3.22, he says, Whatsoever you ask, we receive of him. Why? Because we keep his commandments. And we do the things that are pleasing in his sight. So the word of God must abide in you. Not in your memory, not just to write down, but abide in your heart. Abide in your heart. 1 John 5, 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if he asks anything according to his will, he will hear us. So you must pray, you must repent and be righteous, and you must abide in Christ and his word. The fourth principle is this. You must yield to the Holy Spirit. Our text in James chapter 4, verse 6 to 7 says, He giveth more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resisted the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and the devil will flee from you. You need to submit to God. Don't come with no haughty prayer to try to impress people. It's not about impressing people. The scribes and Pharisees prayed long, long prayer, long, long repetitive prayer to impress people. God not interested in that. You need to pray to impact on God. So surrender, submit to him. Come before him with humility. Some people have no manners. They come demanding this, demanding that, as if God owes you something. God owes you nothing. That's why we take the posture of kneeling. You don't have to kneel, but the posture of kneeling is training your body to say, I surrender. I surrender all to you. I submit to you. That's why we talk about bowing down and worship. But I was not focusing on physical bow down. You could bow down physically and not bow in your heart. So we talk about bow down and worship. Make sure you're bowing down in your heart. Make sure you're humbling yourself before God. So submit yourself to God. Surrender yourself to God. And resist that wicked slew for devil. And he'll have to run. You know why he's running from you? Because you're submitted to God. In Romans 8, 26 it says, Likewise, the Spirit of God helps our infirmities. We have weaknesses, don't we? All of us have weaknesses. Every single person who walks in the flesh have weaknesses. But the Holy Spirit helps us in our infirmities. Sometimes we're so weak, we don't even know what to pray for. We don't even know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself, he makes intercession for us with groaning. Sometimes it can't be uttered. Sometimes only you could say, hmm. Mm. Sometimes you just speak in tongues. Sometimes it pains so deep, you can't even articulate it in words. But the Holy Spirit, nobody knows the mind of a man like the Spirit of a man. And nobody knows the mind of God like the Spirit of God. So let the Holy Spirit pray. Let the Holy Spirit pray. That's why, we like to, that's why I like to worship. Because it puts you in an atmosphere where you focus on God. And you focus on how great God is. And you submit yourself. This is true worship. True worship is not singing slow songs. 
True worship is focusing on how worthy God is, how great is our God, how magnificent God is. And you're just surrendering your spirit. And when you're in that kind of atmosphere, now you could pray. So that's why our services are structured like that. We start in worship. We don't start with no group prayer. Lord bless the thing. And, blah, 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 blah. and we sing to some. Blah, 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 blah. And we say, blah, 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 blah. take up the offering. Somebody preach for five minutes and then we go home an hour. What is that? That is liturgy. That is liturgy. When we worship, we must worship. We must make contact with God. We must see God in our spirit, in our hearts and mind. Not many men talking and ticking and ticking and waiting and thinking. That one singing off the music to love. No, 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 forget all of that. Focus on God. Focus on God. Focus on God. Submit yourself to Him. Draw near to Him. Bow in your spirits. Let Him take over. So when we take the mic and we pray, we move it in and then we give a little exhortation. Why? Because you have to pray in spirit and with the understanding. You have to pray in accordance with the word. Because if you pray outside of the world, you're wasting your time. And nobody knows the mind of God like the Spirit of God. So the worship must take us into that atmosphere where the Spirit takes over. And then the Word comes and add foundation and add information and revelation. And when we combine the Word with the Spirit, you must have answers to your prayer. Because you're praying according to the will of God. And God says, if you ask anything according to my will, it shall be done. Not it will, not it might, not I hope, but it shall be done. That is church. That is not liturgy. So we have a structure. But you mustn't follow the structure ritualistically. You must understand the purpose. And the mindset behind it. And make it work. Work it. Work it. Work it. That's why the worship team and the musicians must come early. Don't come rushing and crawling with your wife and make me late. And then you come up here, pump and pump, and you grab a mic and you sing what you practiced last week. No, it's about the Holy Ghost taking control. It's about leading people into the throne room of God, into the very atmosphere of heaven. It's about bringing heaven on earth. So when we move into our next phase, we move in accordance with God. That's when transformation will take place. That's when deliverance will take place. That's when the glory of God will be seen among us. That's when we begin to rise and shine. And then all the earth will be drawn to our rising and to our light. That is what it's about. Not no ritualistic liturgy. Where sometimes we to stay home and watch TV. But don't stay home and watch TV. That's for people who are sick. And for people on vacation. That's not for you. Don't neglect the assembling of your saints together. There's a difference. When you're watching it on TV. And you're drinking your sweet drink. And you're eating your breakfast. And you're lying down in your bed. And you're watching your little text messages here and there. Whole different thing. But when you're here in the presence of God. Where people are assembled together and they make contact with one another. It's a whole different thing. Don't be no lazy Christian. That facilities for people who are sick, homebound, and people who are on vacation, people who are abroad. Or maybe you're working and you can't come and you just reach home from a late night shift or some kind of thing. What is we talking about? Healing to the Holy Spirit. Romans 6 16. Know you not? That to whom you yield yourself servants to obey his servants you are. To whom you obey, whether you, you yield yourself to sin, you yield yourself to sin unto death. But if you lead yourself to obedience, you lead yourself unto righteousness. So pray, repent and be righteous. Abide in Christ and his word and yield to the Holy Spirit. Two more because we spell in prayer, just in case you're wondering. James chapter 1 again, our main text, James chapter 1 verse 2 to 3. I don't know if we have it there. Could you give us? James 1, 2 to 3. My brethren, this is a hard one. <laughs> but count it a joy when you're seeing pressure. You know, when somebody falls, it's unintended. Falling is different from jumping. Jumping is deliberate. You determine the action you determine the pace and so on. But falling is an accident. Yes. Or somebody trip you. And you lose control. And you find yourself in a situation that sometimes causes pain. Because you fall. And this temptation you're talking about falling in is not a temptation to sin. 
That's a different temptation. This is when you're seeing pressure. Sickness, death, unemployment. Sometimes it's conflict in your home, but sometimes that conflict in your home, you just cause it. And you just contribute it. So you have to be careful about saying that and blaming other people. A servant of God doesn't strife. Six peace. Right? But sometimes some situations, there's just come on here and you don't know what it is going on here. What did I do? What did I do? Hmm. James is telling us that we must count it a joy when these things happen. And not when you have one problem, when you have diverse. Sometimes it's hitting you from all sides. That this one had. So I'll go a little slow. Because I'm still embracing it, eh? To tell you the truth, let me be honest with you. <laughs> I know it's the word of God, but this one not really close. This one right here, so I'm still trying to eat it. You know when your mother gives you things to eat, sometimes you put away the broccoli and you want to eat that and that. You say, eat all of it. Well, Lord is saying, eat all of it right now. This right now is a piece of broccoli on the plate. But we have to eat it. Because it's good for you. Come to the joy. Why? How can I possibly come to the joy? I come to the joy because I know something that the circumstances are not telling me. I come to the joy because I know something that the situation is not telling me. I'm not only to look at the negative side of it, but I'm to look at the fact that I know that when my faith is tried, it works patience. What is patience? Patience is not sitting, sitting idly by twiddling your thumbs, waiting for something to happen. The word patience here means perseverance. Stick to it with this. A character of endurance. Where things could hit me from all sides, but it will hit me, it will break me. It may knock me down, but it will never knock me out. Because even though I fall, I will rise again. I know something. You see, right now, in the first few chapters, I might be going through some stress. But even though I'm going through some stress here, I know how the story ends. I have read the last page. And the last page says God will give me the victory. The last page says that Satan is a defeated foe. The last page says that God will get the glory in this. So I am going through it because I know what I'm going to. I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death because I'm going to a high place that the Lord is preparing me. I'm going through these troubled waters because I know he's going to lead me beside still waters. I'm going through this because I know my present dilemma is not my destiny. So I endure hardship because of what I know. What do you know about God? That's why you need to study his word. Study his word. Luke 18, 7. All right, Luke 18, 5 to 7. This same widow that we talked about earlier. You know why the unrighteous judge gave her justice? Because she troubled him. He said, I will avenge her because she only continually coming and wearing me. That's what the unrighteous judge says in verse 5. Verse 7, Jesus says, And shall not God avenge his own elect? Even an unrighteous judge could do it for a little widow who have no power, no authority because of her perseverance, because of her stick to itness, because of her bulldog faith. You know how a bulldog bites you? You don't, you don't let you go? Because of her bulldog faith, God, would he not avenge his own elect which cry day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them, he will still avenge. In Psalm 27, 13 to 14. In Psalm 27, I love this passage. The psalmist talks about diverse temptations. He talks about fears. He talks about trouble. He talks about broken relationships. Mother and father forsake me. Sometimes your closest relationship, your blood, your immediate family turn against you. The psalmist talked about that. He talks about people lying on you, slandering, making disrepute about your name and so on in public he talks about evil though a host and camp against me sometimes it's spiritual warfare he says you know what i would have fainted i would have given up hope but you know what keep me 
I choose to believe to see the goodness of the Lord right here in the land of living. I'm not giving up and I'm not moving. Right here and I'm moving. I'm not giving up. Right. You want to push me off? You want to push me off? I stay right here because I will believe to see the goodness of the Lord right here. Not to wait till I'm dead and done. Right here. I believe in spite of the trouble, in spite of the fears, in spite of the adversity, in spite of the slander, in spite of the enmity, I choose to believe to see goodness of the Lord right here in the land of the living and that's why I don't faint that's why I don't fear that's why I persevere because of what I believe so this thing about prayer is not going to open up book and read no stupidness these are the things that make prayer powerful There's not no exercise talking to the winner of God. Why don't I shut up? What I want to pray wrong. I want to pray short. He pray good. Ooh. So the psalmist say, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord, people. Wait on the Lord. That's why I come all day and pray. Come all night and pray. Come, come for, uh, uh, when we have prayer mounted and pray. Come early in the morning and pray. Wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, wait, I say. Take your time, don't be too rush. Get up early in the morning and wait on the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And you know what will happen? You'll have strength in your heart. <clears throat> Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. Anybody faint-hearted today? God gives power to the faint. Anybody feel that you have no strength and no might? God increases your strength. Some of you, you depend upon your strength, your physical strength. You're young and you're strong and you can do what you want. But even the youth shall faint and be weary. Even the young shall utterly fall. But, everybody say but. They that wait upon the Lord will get new strength. you get so much strength that you will walk and not be weary. you get so much strength, you'll walk and not faint. you get so much strength that you will not only walk, you will run and not be weary. I just make two steps here and two, two illustrations and I'm panting. But when you wait on the Lord, like the old Archbishop, when you wait on the Lord, you will run and not be weary. As a matter of fact, you'll have so much strength that you'll not only walk and run, but you will mount up with wings as eagles and soar above the tempest of your life. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Do not faint. Do not faint. Luke chapter 11, verse 5 to 9. We're kind of moving between Luke and James. He said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall not go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, let me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me and I have nothing said before him. I make a rule. I don't answer calls between 10 in the night and 6 in the morning. You need to give me some time to sleep and be with my wife. If you keep calling me, I'll take off my phone. Call me in the day. Right? But some people are inopportune. And here's a friend that comes to you at midnight. And what are you asking for? Three loaves of bread for our next friend? <laughs> what kind of thing is that? So a friend of mine in his journey come to me and he have nothing to set before him. That's what he's telling you. So some friend comes to him and he has nothing to feed that friend. So he comes by you who's his friend to ask him for food to feed his next friend. In the middle of the night. And because he's your friend. He says, and he from within shall answer and say, Do not me, my door shut, my children are with me in bed, I can't get up now for you. He said, I say unto you, Jesus is saying, I say unto you, do you don't want to get up, and do you don't want to give him. There are two reasons why you get up and you give him. One is because he's your friend. And the other thing is because of his importunity, meaning his audacity. This man bold enough to come to me in the middle of the night and ask me, for this man must be really desperate. <laughs> so he has to be my friend and it has to be a very audacious request. Importunity is not opportunity. Importunity is audacity. Or what we used to say when we didn't know English. The audacity of this man. <laughs> But it's audacity, bold facedness, asking for something that is beyond your right and privilege. So come to God as a friend and come to Him 
audaciously approach the throne of grace with boldness. And you know what? You gave him all the bread you want. Here, take all, take all, take all. I go back to sleep. Go on, go on, go on. I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. You know, take for example, there's some of you traveling and, and so on, and you're know, going abroad, and some of you say, but you're going on holidays, Pastor, when we're here for so long and so on. But suppose you choose to visit me rather than talk to me here. And you choose to visit me just before you go to the airport. And then when you reach the airport, you realize that you forgot your passport at my house. What's the first thing you'll do? You'll call. But I didn't answer. You call again, and I didn't answer. That's all you go do? Man, I come in. After two, three calls, I come in. So the asking has to go to a more urgent seeking. When they come, you see the door lock. And they see a little light flickering so in a room like somebody watching TV. What are you going to do next? You're going to make some noise. So the asking goes to the more urgent seeking. And the seeking goes to the more urgent knocking. So Jesus says, ask and you will be, it, will, it will be given to you. Sometimes the asking is not enough. You have to seek and you will be fine. Sometimes the asking and the seeking is not enough. You have to knock, bombard the doors of heaven. For your children, for your health, for your finances, for your family, for your country, for your neighborhood, for your church, for yourself. Bombard the doors of heaven. Knock! Pong down the door! I need my passport! <laughs> that Jesus teaching us to pray. How many we just pray for? Gentle Jesus, make a man look up on you. When you get up on your gun, and you go on, and you know why nothing happened. You have to be intense in prayer. You have to be persevering in prayer. You have to be deliberate in prayer. You're going for it. You're going for it. You see that child? That child ain't going to hell. Not on my watch. I'm going for it. 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 I'm going for it until I get I'm going. I'm going for it. I don't want to back. I'm going. I'm going for it. And when I'm done, I'm still going. It's when, when you start to get this, then you start to get prayer. Then you're really praying. All well, the kind of mumsy, pumsy thing, reading all kind of book and thing. No passion, no heart, no sincerity, no intensity. You think the devil respect that? You never glad when you're just religious. Woo. So you need to endure. You need to persevere. You might be beaten, but you mustn't be beaten down. You might be knocked about, but you mustn't be knocked out. Because you're going to persevere with a bulldog feet. You're going to tire not when you reach the end of your rope. Tire not and hang on again. God is coming through for you. He's coming through for you. He's coming through for you. He's going to answer. He's going to hear. He's going to hear your cry. He's going to answer. Bombard the doors of heaven! Final point. You have to reconcile. This is not hard for me, but this is a broccoli for some other people. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 to 26. And when you stand praying, forgive. Not after you pray. Not after the service is over. Not when it's convenient. Not if the person come and tell you, ah, sorry. It is right there when you're praying, you have to forgive. This is Jesus talking. You know, this when I preach and I just quote Jesus plenty, plenty, plenty. Because I want to stay very close to the accuracy of the word. And I want to just rep- re- repeat false prophecies. That's what happened in the Old Testament. They borrowed and they stole ideas from one another. And they propagated false prophecies. 
and false interpretations. And that's why the nation of Israel was plunged into spiritual darkness when they couldn't hear from God again. I don't want to be guilty of that. I have a responsibility as pastor of this church during my tenure to rightly divide the word of truth. I have to be very careful of the source of food. I can't feed you with plastic cabbage. Or, 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 or even good food that is infested with all sorts of chemicals that will kill you and get cancer. I have to be very responsible to give you the pure, unadulterated word of God. So that when you eat, you'll be healthy. Sometimes you might not like it, but as a father, I say, eat it. It's good for you. And you're not leaving here until you clean your plate. So we have one little piece again before you clean your plate. Don't watch time now. When you're by the beach, you don't watch time. When you're with your friends, you don't watch time. You're in the presence of God and you're being fed good food. Don't watch time now. It's amazing how much time you just waste doing nothing. It's a matter of priority. Where are rich? Mark eleven twenty five. When you pray, yes, eat all your food. I like you there. Eat all your food. My mother trained me well, you know. That's why my wife had no problem with me. Whatever she cook, I just eat. See, she just make it easy. She just cook good. She knows how to present it. So I hope I'm presenting it in a way that is palatable. So if you have ought against any, that means... You're holding something in your craw. Somebody offend you and you're holding it in your craw. So, you have ought against any. You love everybody, you know, see that brother, that brother hurt me. Your father which is in heaven, if you have ought against any, that your father also is in heaven, may forgive you your sins. So in other words, you need to forgive if you have ought against another, so that God will forgive you. If you don't release that person, don't expect God to release you. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So you are asking God for something that you're not prepared to give somebody else? Don't you know that you have ought against God? Have you checked your history? Have you checked your, your, your storyline from birth to now? You really feel God owe you something? You know what you deserve? You know what we deserve? Hellfire. For the way that we have treated God's grace. And we beg in God for forgiveness. And then somebody offend you. And you're not even willing to consider forgiveness. You're not even willing to consider releasing them. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. I'm not going to let go. And I'm not going to forget. And then you're asking God to throw your sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Luke eleven four. 4. Jesus teaching them to pray. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. So you're asking God to forgive you as you forgive others. So if you don't forgive others, then you're asking God not to forgive you. I know you're intelligent people and you fully well understand what I'm saying. Some of you looking for an argument to rebut. But it would be very strange to hear what that argument is. I find it is very clear as day. In scripture, I find no other way of interpreting this. Matthew chapter 5 verse 23 to 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and your gift is even your worship, your gift is your service, your gift is your money, you bring your gift to the altar... And while you're there, you remember now that is your brother who was against you. You remember is you who got your brother vexed, and is your brother who holding you in his court. And you know you offend somebody. Jesus is saying, leave your gift right there. Don't bring it. You put on your uniform to come and usher. But you know you offend somebody. Don't turn around and don't shake their hand when they walk through the door. It's best you go back home and take off your uniform. You come to lead worship. You come to play an instrument. You come to preach. You come to do the multimedia. All of that is your gifts. 
that you're bringing to the Lord. Don't feel like because you're not on stage, you're not bringing your gift. This is a very serious thing. We're talking about prayer. And we want to know why it is we pray and pray and have prayer meeting, pray and pray and nothing happening. I'm telling you now. I'm telling you now based on the word of God. What are the hindrances and helps the prayer? It's up to us now to eat our broth and digest it. So he said, before you come here and you beat your drums and you play your instrument, go and reconcile to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Very serious, our human relationships impact our relationship with God. And our relationship with God should influence our relationship with others. The Apostle John says, if you walk in the light as he's in the light, you see I have a cross here. This is a symbol of Christianity. The vertical part is our relationship with God. And the horizontal part is our relationship with each other. So if you walk in the light as he's in the light, you're going to have fellowship with one another. And then the blood of Jesus, God's Son, will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But if you're not walking in light as he's in the light, then your relationship with others would be like this. It'd be out of sync because your relationship with God is out of sync. So you can't say you're straight with God and you're, you're not straight with your brothers. If you're so, then it means something else wrong. So, so before you bring a gift, Go and reconcile to your brother and then come and offer your gift. That's why when people are sinning and so on in the church and they have a conflict, I say, well, sin and ministry can't go together. But don't stop the ministry, stop the sin. You're only very quiet about that. You want them to stop both the ministry and the sin? Stop the ministry and then go back out in the world where they have no friends in church, everybody watching them, like if they have some kind of leprosy. And then the friends say, come on, let me party, let me smoke a party. And when we finish, we go drink a Guinness. And you there watching them, it's gone. No, yes, you might settle down and sit down for a little while, but you're still welcome because you're repenting. And we want to restore you. All right, when you break your foot, we put, <laughs> when it, <laughs> we put it in a little cast. But we don't despise you. We help you along. We get a little wheelchair. We get a little stick and thing. And then eventually you gain your strength. We don't say, you stay out there until you get better. And then you come. You may never get better. Don't let wounded soldiers die. Many people die because they're wounded by what we do, by what we fail to do, by how we react. And we continue to offer our gift. And we don't reconcile. We don't care for one another. How do you expect God to care for you when you don't care about his body? His body. We are his body. When we hurt each other, we hurt him because we are his body. When we despise each other, we despise him because we are his body. I wasn't here long, so I'm giving you all I have. But I reached the airport and I circled the land. First Peter 3, 7. Husband and wife. Yes, I'm getting in your marriage business. Yes, I'm getting in your business home. You husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Give honor to your wife. So I see man in the house and I listen that you must respect your wife. And don't tolerate no disrespect. Eh? And if you're in a relationship where nobody respects you, you need to stand up. Don't tolerate disrespect. That is not of God. If somebody doesn't respect you, that's a wrong relationship. Me tell you, you get divorced. Eh? I just tell you it's a wrong relationship. You have to decide how you'll deal with that. But we need to respect one another. So men must honor women as the weaker vessel. I was explaining this somewhere. Where you? In Muruga. It was in Muruga Tuesday night. You need to walk with my book. Weaker doesn't mean inferior. Don't get wax. I mean, don't get confused. <laughs> Weaker doesn't mean inferior. A woman was made, Eve was made out of Adam's rib. So he was made from his side, not from his head. To dominate him. And not from his toe for him to trot upon her and mash her down. From his side. So I don't believe in saying behind every good man is a good woman. It's at the side of every man is a good woman. A woman stands at his side. Which speaks of a certain level of equality. She doesn't stand under his feet. She stands at his side. 
She doesn't stand behind him like I in front and you in the back. No, we're side by side. We're walking together. Two can't walk together except they agree. Are you understand what I'm saying? From there his heart to be loved by him. From under his arm to be protected by him. Now Eve came out of Adam. But after Adam, every single man come out of a woman. Which one are you meant to have a mother? You might know who your father is. It might be daddy, maybe, but it's definitely mommy's baby. So woman come out of man and man come out of woman. We need each other. I need you to survive and you need me. Actually, we're going to make 31 years on Tuesday. So, let me see. So, God says in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image and likeness and let them have dominion. And then verse 27 says, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So both male and female was created in the image and likeness of God, not the man alone. And God blessed them. God didn't bless him. God blessed them, the male and female. And said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue the earth. So both men and women are to work together in subduing the earth and controlling the environment. Which speaks of partnership. It doesn't speak of gender governance. Where I rule it over you and I dominate you. The Apostle Paul teaches us that in Christ, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, barbarian nor Greek. So there's an equality before God. Now, of course, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. But in verse 16, it says we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we need both to submit to God. Verse 21, it says submitting yourself to each other, so there must be mutual respect. And then it says, wives, submit to your husbands. So we submit to God, we submit to each other, and we submit to order and structure. Because every organization needs a head, a leader, and the husband is the leader. But he must be leader if Christ is his leader. And then you have that cover. So if I have a plastic glass here, and I have a crystal glass here, plastic cup and a crystal glass, because plastic can be glass, and there's an earthquake and both fall, which one will break? Crystal glass. But which one is more expensive? So weaker doesn't mean inferior. Weaker just means you need to be treated with a little more tenderness, ten tenderness, delicacy, and care. Not inferior. As a matter of fact, it might just be a little more expensive. <laughs> if you have male and female children, you'll know which one has cost you more. Ah, all hell, you know, all 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 you know. So you need to honor your wife as a weaker vessel and as a joint heir, which speaks of the equality. Both of us are heirs to the grace of life. But this is the point to our message. You need to treat your wife with respect and honor according to knowledge. Otherwise, your prayers are going to be hindered. So you in church praying up a storm and on Tuesday you're stamping and spitting and thing, thing, and you're going home and you have no respect for your wife. You're treating like a dog. You're treating like a flock. God. And you think God impressed by your Tuesday performance? Or your Sunday morning performance? You're singing and you're playing and you're this and you're that and you're just cussing up your wife anyway. No respect. Treat her like a dog. And you think God hearing you? You think God taking you on? So we need to reconcile. It's not only in terms of relationships in the church. The story goes right back home. It reminds me of a church where a fellow was given communion. He was an elder in a church, well respected. And his wife got up and started to cry. Loud in the church, brother, so and so, you're beating me home and you're serving communion. <laughs> Sister, be say expose him. I had to deal with it different, but <laughs> I don't like embarrassing people. 
You cannot come in the office and talk to the pastor. You cannot expose it that way. You know, you know sometimes you need to bring things out in the light. Deal with it one-to-one and so on. But she was desperate. I don't know if she talked to the pastor and he didn't take her on. But embarrassed. So we need to reconcile. Amen? So we know how to pray now, right? How do you spell prayer? P, pray. R, repent and be righteous. A, abide in Christ and his word. Y, yield to the Holy Spirit. E, enjoy and persevere. And R, reconcile. Let's stand.